how we wanted to begin this lectureship, which we have been excitedly anticipating for some time, we thought that we might begin with one of our brightest uh, scholars among us who could lay the groundwork and give us an overview of our subject, and that has been accomplished. We also thought what we would like to do is have one of the greatest gospel preachers living among us to come and to speak with regard to, uh, as Jeff encouraged, uh, as the scriptures point us to so many direct corrections, the foundation of it all, Genesis chapter 1. There's much that can be said of, about Eric, things that are often said, uh, the fact that he is a, a Marine, the fact that he is a preacher and an elder for the congregation in Avondale, Georgia, who travels widely to preach the gospel. Uh, some of the best commendations come from so many of our members. We had Eric here for a gospel meeting uh, several years ago, and uh, we had members coming in, not that we would say about others, but they said, I've been thinking about coming to this meeting tonight all day long on the job. As I talked to some others, but they said, uh, I listen to him on my podcast as I'm working out uh, because they so much pray the way that he presents God's truth. We're indebted to have Brother Eric Holmes here to speak to us from the great chapter of the Bible on our subject. We're dealing with Genesis chapter 1. Good evening. Good evening. I'm honored and humbled to be here this evening. I appreciate so much the invitation. Appreciate the good work that's being done here and uh, at the school and district congregation. Appreciate your presence here tonight. I appreciate the last session that we just heard. Appreciate Brother Miller and the good work that's being done at Apologetic Express. Uh, and I, I would urge you all to continue to go to that site and follow effort that's being done there. Truly amazing work, faith building and encouraging. Brother Mill, Brother Mill was hurt in the last hour and I was hoping he didn't preach my, my material. Uh, he could have easily. We saw that. He said, I'm just going to touch the service. I thought it took me hours and hours and hours. He just waved his hand. I could do it like that. Uh, he did an outstanding job. I appreciate, appreciate him. In fact, it be quoted tonight. I read so much from Apology Express and I prepared this material. I'm supposed to preach Genesis chapter 1, and we will. Seemed like a good place to start, though, would be Acts chapter 17. Because <laughs> it sure seemed like the Apostle Paul wanted to preach Genesis 1. I'm thankful that we have men again, like Brother Miller and others, who do the work that they do. I find it personally very difficult to do. Uh, I am benefited absolutely from apologetics. It's, it's strengthened my faith. It's helped me tremendously. I just find it very difficult to have a conversation, uh, partly because the evidence is so overwhelming. It's hard for me to stand in water and try to convince you that it's wet. It's just hard. Uh, it's hard to stand on green grass and tell you this is not the sky. And it is indeed grass and it's green and it's not blue. So overwhelming is God's evidence that it is difficult. In fact, tomorrow I have the privilege to speak to the young people. The topic is the fool has said in his heart there is no God. That's God's position on a man who denies the evidence. Uh, the Apostle Paul says in Acts chapter 17, verse 24, beginning, he said, God that made the world, all things that are therein. He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelling not in temples made with hands. He's not worship with man's hands, though he needed anything, Paul goes on to say. Seeing as though he gave it to all life and breath, made of all one blood. This verse 27, I'm particularly interested in him. For their Paul says that they should seek the Lord. Happy they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from them. If God is, and God made the world, what would we expect to find from him? Would we not expect him to then tell us that he made it? Would he not expect us to ask him to tell us of our origin? How we got here, who he is, that he made it all. Would we not expect him to tell us what he has done for us, what he will do for us, how he made us, how we're to live here, where we're going when we leave here? The truth of the matter is, we find nearly or all of these things in the first chapter of the Bible. Genesis is the foundation of the Bible. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are the foundation of Genesis. The first chapter is the foundation of the first 11. 
In his book, Does God Exist?, Kyle Butts spoke about the process of searching for truth. He wrote of something he called explanatory value. He explained it this way, quote, with an ever-increasing number of skeptics, unbelievers, atheists, and agnostics in the United States and around the globe, it is important for Christians to look for ways to teach them about God and then Jesus Christ. One way to do that is to show that the concept of God maintains much more powerful explanatory value for the realities that we see around us than atheism offers. Thus, when approaching a reality upon which both theists and atheists agree, the question would be which idea, theism or atheism, explains this particular phenomenon the best. Apply that then as we go throughout this material, as we look at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis teaches us the origin of the universe, the origin of time, space, and matter, the origin of life, the origin of the celestial bodies, the origin of animal life, the origin of humanity. Concerning the origin of the universe, nothing has better explanatory value for the existence of everything, including humanity and the cosmos, than the very first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, theists and atheists agree that we're both here, that the universe does exist. Which system, then, best explains it? Genesis 1 teaches us that there is a God and that God must be eternal, for he is before the beginning. The psalmist agrees with this. Verse number 1 and verse number 2 of Psalm 90, the Bible describes the, the God of heaven in these words. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Eternal life better explains the universe than does eternal matter. In fact, it was touched on in the last session that matter is not eternal. The first and second laws of thermodynamics absolutely state that this is the case. Additionally, matter cannot and does not create itself. Space, time, and matter were created at the same time. Going further, Morris wrote this, The universe is actually a continuum of space, matter, and time no one of which can have a meaningful existence without the other two. The term matter is understood to include energy and must function in both space and time. Space, then, is measurable and accessible to sense operation only in terms of the entities that exist and the events that happen in space. And these require both matter and time. The concept of time, he continued, likewise is meaningful only in terms of entities and events existing and transpiring during time, which likewise requires space and matter. The universe is not part space, part time, and part matter, but rather all space, all time, all matter, and so is a true triunity. Again, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, time, God, force, created, action, heavens, space, and the earth matter. Neither time, matter, nor space created itself, Neither did one exist while the others evolved. Matter is not eternal. Genesis 1 1 teaches us that God made it all and that God is before the beginning. Which one has better explanatory value? That God is the cause of creation. Things weren't made by accident or random chance. Matter didn't create itself. Eternal life plus infinite power is how the world was created. In fact, the scripture speaking of God's power simply states, God spoke the world into existence. Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light. The phrase, and God said, is repeated in verse 6, verse 9, 11, 14, 19, 24, and 26. The psalmist said it this way, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters and the seas together as a heap. He laid up the depth in storehouses. Let the earth fear the Lord, that all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Genesis 1 is in harmony with the law of cause and effect. The law states that every material effect must have an adequate antecedent or simultaneous cause. 
Robert Jastro, founder and former director of the Goddard Institute for the Space Studies at NASA, said this, the universe and everything that happens in it since the beginning of time are a grand effect without a known cause. An effect without a known cause, he continued. That is not the world of science. It is a world of witchcraft, of wild events, and the winds of demons. A medieval world that science has tried to banish. As scientists, what are we to make of this picture? I do not know. I would only like to present the evidence for the statement of the universe. This is what happens when you preach with something electronic. It's that tendency to go out. Right in the middle of a quote from Robert Jasper. You think I didn't know that? <laughs> <laughs> and then when you get nervous, you'll forget your password. <laughs> <laughs> I've been nervous about this all day. Uh, weeks, months. Not my specialty, not at all. He went on, I would only like to present the evidence for the statement that the universe and man himself originated in a moment when time began. He said the problem is we have a grand effect with no known cause. That's not the problem. The problem is for those who choose not to believe, the only adequate cause is God. Considering the first and second laws of thermodynamics, considering the evolution model, creation model, considering the laws of cause and effect, which model has the best explanatory value for the origin of the universe? Friends, it's Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and it's God that created the world. Genesis 1 teaches us the origin of life. Again, explanatory value. Apply it here. The first obstacle for atheism and evolution is how did matter create itself? The second insurmountable problem is how did they have inorganic matter give rise to living beings? The only option for those who reject God is a biogenesis. According to dictionary.com, a biogenesis is defined as the now discredited theory that living organisms can arise spontaneously from inanimate matter. Spontaneous generation. You heard it correctly. That's the definition. The now discredited theory. It's called such because we know it's not true. In fact, that article that I read from Apologetic Express, written by Jim Miller. He wrote this, men such as Francisco Reedy were among the first to show that spontaneous generation was not true. With his test of maggots forming on meat, he went on to say, Reedy hypothesized that the maggots actually rose from eggs that were laid by flies on the meat. His experiment was conducted in 1688. Reedy's work was followed by Lazaro Spallanzini. I was practicing my Italian. They are miserable. Nevertheless, he used gravy for his experiments, came to the same conclusion. Life does not arise from dead matter. Again, Miller wrote, Spallanzini and Reedy was still not enough to drive the proverbial nail into the coffin of spontaneous generation. It wasn't until 1864 and the work of French scientist Louis Pasteur that the hypothesis was finally disproved. George Wall stated this, one only has to contemplate the magnitude of this task to conceive the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Yet, here we are as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. He says it's not possible, but I, I, I believe that's why we're here. Joshua again wrote this. At present, science has no satisfactory uh, answer to the question of the origin of life on Earth. Perhaps the appearance of life on Earth is a miracle. Scientists are reluctant to accept that view, but their choices are limited. Either life was created on the Earth by the will of a being outside the grasp of scientific understanding, or it evolved on our planet spontaneously through chemical reactions occurring in non-living matter lying on the Earth's surface, on the surface of the planet. He went on to say the first theory placed the question of origin life beyond the reach of scientific inquiry. It is a statement of faith in the power of a supreme being, not the subject of the laws of science. The second theory is also an act of faith. The act of faith consists in assuming that the scientific view of the origin of life is correct without having concrete evidence to support that belief. True faith is based on knowledge. 
It is based on evidence. In fact, God demands that we have evidence for our faith. The Hebrew writer says, Now faith is the subject of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders have made a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, listen to it, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. God put the world here and then showed us our, our universe, ourselves, our world, and then said, reason from what's here to what is not seen. Life didn't arise spontaneously. God made life. In fact, life comes from life. That's biogenesis. When would God tell us that? How about in the first chapter of the first book? God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yield be seed, the fruit tree yield be fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth grass, herb yield be seed after its kind, the tree yield be fruit, whose seed was in itself after its kind. God saw that it was good. What about the living creatures? The waters brought forth abundantly moving creatures that had life, found that they may fly above the earth in the open firmament. God created the well. Every living creature that moved the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. Every wing fowl after his kind. God saw that it was good. God blessed him, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters, the seas, let fowl multiply the earth. God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, creepy things, beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the field after its kind, the cattle after their kind. And God saw everything that he had made, and it was good. If God is we would expect him to tell us that, in the, listen, the first chapter of the first book, physically, spiritually, the seed principle works. We reap what we sow. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that. We plant corn. We plant green beans. No farmer says, I wonder what's going to come up. <laughs> The Apostle Paul wrote concerning this law spiritually. Please pay attention to the first three words. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What sort of man? So if that shall be also replaced, that's true physically and spiritually. The evidence is overwhelming. It tells us life is eternal. And eternal life gave rise to life on earth. The material was made, the material world was made by the immaterial. The natural by the supernatural. Faith is trusting the evidence. Spontaneous generation or life creating life. Which has more explanatory value? Which is more in keeping with the evidence? Genesis 1 teaches us the sun, the moon, the stars. Better explained by creation and the God of heaven. God saw, or let, said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the midst of the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Without God, how would we explain the sun, the moon, and stars coming into existence? When one begins to study the distance, the diameter, the activity, the sun, the moon, and the stars, the numbers become so large as it becomes difficult to comprehend. Curtis Gates wrote, the sun is the map and power plant of the earth. Life without it would be impossible. Alfred Gerwinkel wrote, the distance of the sun is just right. If the distance were 120 million miles instead of 93 million, our planet would be a perpetual frozen Arctic, and life on it would be impossible. If the distance were only 60,000 miles, the Earth's surface would be a glowing furnace. The perfect balance has been maintained with mathematical precision. It is against reason and evidence to believe the innumerable stars and the existence, the location, the activity of the sun and the moon all are the result of blind, random, accidental chance events. Instead, we would expect the vastness, the complexity, and the wonder of the universe to be purposeful. And it is. The creation is like a heavenly, universal neon sign. 
pointing us back to God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his hand. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone throughout the whole earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run his race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Noting just a few things that David describes the creation as doing, he says it's speaking and it's teaching. Among the things that doing, creation speaks daily. The psalmist says, day unto day. From the fourth day until now, the creation has been speaking. The creation speaks intelligently. Night unto night, they show knowledge. The creation speaks universally. There is no speech, no language, where their voice is not heard. God wants everyone, everywhere, to hear the voice of creation, to see his glory declared. Amen. The amount of water on the earth, the distance of the sun, the tilt of the earth, the rotation of the earth, all point to intelligent design and infinite power. The celestial bodies are for signs, for seasons, for days and years. You don't have to be an astronomer to know that the universe is not the result of blind, random chance events. Genesis 1 has more explanatory value than evolution. Genesis 1 teaches us the origin of humanity. God said, let us make man in our image after our way. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Of all the great and grand evidences for the existence of God, there may be none greater than you. Humans are unique in the universe. It's as if five days were spent in preparation for day six. In fact, the prophet seems to say as much. Isaiah wrote, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker. Ask me of the things to come concerning my sons, concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he has established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. The end of creation is the crown of creation. The fact that man is different is immediately seen from the words you the attention given, and the action taken by God to create us. It's as if God stops and pauses and says, now, let's do something special. Of humanity, God says, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Man is made of spirit and of flesh. He is material and immaterial. Jesus said, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Zechariah said it this way The burning of the word of the Lord of Israel, said the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. The author of Hebrews refers to God as the Father of spirits. Paul prayed that God would sanctify the brethren holy, spirit, soul, and body. Consider the wonderfully encouraging words from Psalm 8. Notice again the contrast between men and animals. The psalmist says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? The psalm reads as if, at least in my mind, for what that's worth, it reads to me as if the, 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 the sentiment is spoken from heaven. As if a heavenly being has peered over the edge of heaven and looked down. After taking in the grand and vastness of the creation, it's as if after looking at all that God had made up there, he then looked down, turned his attention to God, and said, When I consider the work of your hands, 
sun and the moon and the stars must look glorious. But he must have been perplexed because he said, in light of that, what is that? What is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you visit him. And then there are four things stated in the psalm about man. These things are enough for discussion. They're stated as having been done by God. And the one of the things he says are these. He says, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Heard this case many years ago on the track, a little lower man, a little lower than angels, much higher than apes. <laughs> The psalmist says, you did it, God. You made man a little lower than the angels, but more than that. You crowned him with glory and honor. You set him over the works. You gave him dominion over the works of your hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. And so there can be no, no confusion. He lists some things. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the pass of the sea. When you open up scripture, you begin to read, God is constantly telling us, you are not an animal. It is absolutely amazing that man says, yes, I am. <laughs> are we animals? We are not instinctive like animals. The leopard can't change his spots, nor the zebra his stripes. But humans can change. Humans can change their minds and their actions. We can not only consider a matter, we can reconsider it. We can ponder an outcome, change our course, and arrive at a new and different destination altogether. The call of God for sinners to repent is evidence that we can and we must. Jesus said, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Paul's words to the Corinthians can never be said to animals. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed. But you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Surely everyone can see a difference between the boy in the pen with the pigs and the pigs in the pen with the boy. One sinned against heaven. One sinned against his father. One came to himself. Pigs in a pen eating slop are at themselves. A boy in a pen with pigs is not at himself. The boy got up and left the pig's pen. The boy went home. The boy repented. He changed his mind and his actions. The boy knew he was different. So did his father. We are not animals. According to Jesus, we are more valuable than animals. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What you should eat, what you should drink, or yet for your body, what you should put on. Is not the life more than meat of the body than raiment? Behold the fathers of the air, for they sow not neither do they reap nor gather in the barn. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Humans are more valuable than animals because humans were made in the image of God. We have an eternal nature, we are spirit like our heavenly Father. Therefore, human life is sacred. It is God given and it is God like. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he not man. Is killing humans the same as killing ants or gnats? Are humans the same as bacteria? Of course, one atheist said, Is the cow our cousin? Thankfully, our Lord thinks we are worth more than animals. Are not five sparrows sold for two parties and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not ye, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. God is telling us we are more valuable and we are arguing with him no we are not. No wonder why we struggle in our world. Humans are moral animals than us. Humans know right and wrong, good and bad, moral and immoral. 
Words like murder and rape and lying and stealing, fornication, adultery, drunkenness, and such like have meaning to humans. They have no meaning at all to animals. Lions never go home sad after chasing, catching, and eating gazelles. They never go home. Can't you see the different discussion? This is the last time. <laughs> I've got to keep this happy. I'm going to hurt the gazelles now. There's no way I'm going to keep doing it. No laws in the jungle. No representatives, no delegates to the convention, no. The evidence demands the conclusion morality is objective and absolute. We know it is because of the perfect character of God. He is the absolute good by which morality is measured. However, when God is rejected, man must admit that morality is neither objective nor absolute. And that simply does not align with the evidence, and yet it must be believed. Neither matter nor nature alone can produce objective morality. Atheism has to teach that morals are autonomous and situational. And what is right in one instance could be wrong in another. It's not difficult to see the absolute impossibility of consistently applying that concept. Morals are not like burger chains and toppings. And everyone who knows anything knows that. If morals are autonomous, how can anyone ever tell another person that they're wrong? It'd be impossible for you to tell me murder is wrong, or rape, or steal in any situation. So I'm trying to get around in the skirt by saying, well, you, you, it would be for the greater good. I would have to explain why any animal at any time would be concerned. Since we are simply animals with no soul, there is no heaven, no hell, no afterlife, no God. No one could give a legitimate reason as to why one animal would forgo his pleasure for the desire of the group. Genesis 1 teaches humans are different than and above animals. Theists believe in an afterlife. Theists believe in the eternal, infinite, holy God of heaven. For those who believe in God, he's the absolute good. Without him, nothing can be objectively called good. Try as you might. Atheists do not have a legitimate reason for morality. In fact, personally, this is again one of my great, great frustrations. We're told over and over and over again, nothing matters, nothing matters, nothing matters. You don't matter. Why doesn't matter? None of it matters. And then the very next sentence, somebody wants to save the world. For what? <laughs> Nobody wants to find their purpose. There is no purpose. You just spent books and books and books, paragraph after paragraph, telling me I'm worthless. The world is worthless. There is nothing after us. And then the same book, but we need to figure out what the problem we need to save the planet. We need to do that. We don't need to do any such thing. Is there no, if there is no meaning, then that's just the point. There is no meaning. But there is. And we know it is. And even those who deny it know it is. No one has ever arrested, tried in jail for killing ants. Despite the sad, inconsistent claims of some, when humans are killed, we expect the murderer to be arrested, tried, and punished. Our country and others have suffered the loss of life too many times to enumerate. Every time I see something, though, because of this subject, I I'm just curious, how do the atheists deal with it? How do you deal with the Holocaust, slavery, school shooting, 9-11? Given their position, how do they deal with it? Were these things objectively morally wrong? Or did those who did them simply respond to their evolutionary impulse? Were the, perpetra perpetra the perpetrators morality, situational, and autonomous? If so, what is wrong for one person it cannot be said to be wrong for another. After any such event, one of the things that never happens is no atheist ever gets on television and tells the whole world, coincidentally, the position I hold would say about this event, it was actually nothing objectively wrong about it or wrong. Instead, what they do is they take an objective moral position and claim that suffering and evil in the world is proof that God does not exist. But if atheism is true, what is suffering? 
What is evil? It's simply the survival of the fittest being lived out and the unfit being weeded out. That's all. And what is wrong with that? Because that's the very position we have. What can be wrong or right if there is no objective standard? If there is no absolute good, what are you calling wrong? I heard, I believe it was uh, Barbara, the baby kind of book, and this subject came up. And the subject of rape, the question of rape was asked. And he answered it something like this. He said, well, if raising a woman to save millions of lives, I'd hate to do it. And it was at that point that I almost just lost it. Why would he do it? It wouldn't be wrong. What hate would he have? But he finished the sentence. I hate to do it, but I do it because I can say it makes no earthly sense, friends, and that's the sad position you are in. The evidence is overwhelming. Man is unique and special. He's above the animal, and his life is sacred. Expressly because what's recorded in Genesis. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping being that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Genesis is the foundation of the Bible. Genesis 1 through 11 is the foundation of Genesis. And Genesis 1 is the foundation of the first 11 chapter. The creation of time, space, and matter. The creation of the world. The creation of the trees and vegetation. The origin of the sun, moon, stars, fish and birds, land, animals, all prepared for man and woman who were made a little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor, set over the work of God's hand. All recorded in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. How sad that some was not believed. Every house is built by some man, but he who built all things is God. Despite our disbelief, God still loves us so. God has given great evidence pointing us back to him. With a reason from that which is seen to that which is unseen. He made the world, he made you. He desires for you to be a home again to heaven. And even when we sin, he loved us so. And he sent his only begotten son to die for us that we might be with him. We started with Acts chapter 17. It seemed like a fitting place to end. We read verse 27 that they should seek the Lord. Paul gives a reason for this. He says, The time of this ignorance got weak. But now I commanded all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. God is going to judge the world, friends. Either Jesus is going to come back, or you're going to go into eternity. But before either of these things happen, you need to obey the gospel. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24. You need to repair, turn from your sin, change your heart, change your mind. Lectureships like these, the lessons that will be given. Christianity is a learned religion to be intent that we might learn of God, learn of Jesus. And through that learning, change our mind and our course of action in our lives. Confess the name of Jesus, put the old man to death, and be buried with him for the remission of sin. And let God, through Jesus, save you from your sins. Friends, I would be amazed, quite frankly, at one day. What more could God do? What more could He give? What more evidence could He set forth that you and I might believe Him? He's given His word. He's given His word. He's given His Son. Won't you accept His grace before it's eternally too late as we stand and as we sing?